Marin Hinkle, you've worked in television before. You've uh, worked in film. You've worked in stage. What's different to the marvelous Mrs. Maisel than anything you've done before? You know, uh, I love that um, the way that Amy Sherman Palladino and her husband Dan work on scenes is to actually really hope that we have rehearsal, which doesn't always work out, but often we have been able to. And when we rehearse it, it's like being uh, worked on as if it was a play. And so you've got these long shots, you've got steady cam that's gonna have to kind of figure out their one place that they can best see the scene. And in most of the TV that I had done prior to that, there were a lot of shots, a lot of coverage, a lot of, you know, right on into the face. But I love that the whole body is seen and that a scene like with a camera just in the back watching it all play out as if you were an audience uh, watching a theater piece. I, I think that's what kind of makes this unique. And it allows for that um, repartee that Amy and Dan are so you know famous for to happen so quickly, because if you had to do it and do all the coverage, obviously it couldn't have that speed because we're overlapping often. And it is very musical. So I'm not a musical theater person per se in terms of my abilities, but I love the genre. And I feel like in a way we're doing a musical without the music or a musical without the song because you know how they add beautiful music in underneath sometimes. So that's what I, I, I feel like it's a way in which different kind of uh, genres are, are sort of compiled in, in one. Mm. And like, I guess, how does that sort of like different process um, affect you being able to perform uh, your character? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, you know, I, I don't think I had done much period television. And one of the things that is am amazing about doing this is, so we've got 1958, we've got Upper West Side, and it allows for you to be kind of an archeological digger where you have to go into the history and time and study it in a way that when you're doing a contemporary piece, you just kind of look outside and that becomes your basis of information to grow on. So I kind of, I got lost in, in, in a good way in looking through old magazines from the time because my character's sort of so obsessed with what she looks like. And, 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 and the woman who does our costumes is a genius, Donna Sakowska, and she would show me pages and pages of, you know, the way that the hats were and the way the pins were. And I guess that's what made this a new challenge for me is that I don't, I, I don't know how often I've had to kind of fall fall into like a, another historical time period. And I love that when you do that, you, you find yourself so distant from yourself that you kind of have to, you have to trust yourself in a different way than, than when you're just gonna be in a contemporary piece of work. So another example is the, is the wigs. They take, um, you know, a good sometimes hour to put on. Mine is a half wig where they're putting half my hair up and then they're using the front half and curling it and make it into the, all these designs. And then they're adding things that in real life I don't, I don't do. I don't wear false eyelashes. I don't put on gobs of makeup. And so after, you know, when you have uh, sort of the two hour transformation period, you suddenly feel like you've become another person, which I, I love. How did you come to get the role of Rose Wiseman? I wish I could say I'm at a place in my life where I just pick up the phone and hear, you got the job. But to be honest, um, you know, I, it's good. I have a, a, a body of work. I'm an older, I guess we could call middle-aged woman now. Um, so in this case, I believe the uh, casting director, uh, well, I think there's a, a number of casting directors. There's ones for Amazon, which is, you know, obviously what, what is the, kind of parenting organization, but then there are all these different other people that were involved in the casting. So I got word from my agent that there was a woman, a grandma uh, in the 1950s, and um, she was, uh, the description was that she enters the room as if in an MGM musical, which is interesting to my point earlier. So she, and it also said she was wearing, I think like a satin robe with like feathers on it. So the way I got this role is unusual for my other process, processes. Um, I went to a costume shop in Los Angeles and um, 
I kind of tried on wigs and costumes and found even ones that did have feather boas to them. And I even took the costumes and I sort of sewed them together very delicately and made sure that I could unsew them by the time I returned it back. I don't think they know that, by the way, the costume shop. So when I went to the Valley in uh, California and I opened up the door, I went to a bathroom and I kind of transformed. And then I went into audition uh, for Jeannie Backrack and tried to just be another person. And then that was just the beginning. Months later, I heard that Amy and Dan wanted to see me in New York. So I was flown to New York, had to sort of rethink how I was going to dress. And then I was flown home. And then I got another phone call saying, you have to fly back again. So I did a lot of hoops of jumping in before I actually was told that I could play this role. <laughs> There weren't any costume shops in New York. You know, it's funny. Um, I was staying in a hotel and there was a secondhand clothing store and I walked in and I got all these 1950s clothes and I went, this is no joke, I'm kind of a bag lady and I went to my audition with about four different possibilities because I kind of wanted to feel the feeling of what was the right thing in the room. Because sometimes if you do that, people think you're a little nuts and, um, you know, I am a little nuts, but I, I definitely didn't want to be uh, appear too much that way. So what happened was I walked into the room and I met Amy and Dan and I was kind of in my regular attire. And then I was trying to do a second scene. So I think I slipped out and changed in the bathroom and then wore my sort of costume for the second audition. Oh, nice. Um, what, what's your favorite thing about the character of Rose? You know, uh, that's thank you. That's a great question. I, I I'm kind of a mess in real life. Um, I wear glasses. I might have to put them back on. I, you know, have my hair is kind of always up, and I look, as I said, sort of a little like a bag lady. I think I'm teased as such. Um, but I love that Rose is so. A, <laughs> She's so focused on making sure she's doing the right thing and appearing the right way. And, and, and there's something about that, which is like she has a performance each day. Um, and I feel like that kind of attention to detail is, is sort of extraordinary. It makes her an artist. The way she puts herself together has artistry, and I'm so not that way, and it's kind of a joy to try that on for size, and then it's kind of a joy at the end of the day to sort of come back to my usual, you know, crazy kind of mess. But I, I love that about her, and I also love, one more thing, I love how much she cares about family. I, I think, you know, I'm a mom myself, um, Rose obviously has two children and she, they are the world to her and particularly her relationship to her daughter. I think she she sort of sees that uh, she's living through Midge and that's one of the most frightening things about what happens in that first season is that suddenly she sees that her daughter actually wants to sort of separate from, from her. And in that time period, I think my character just feels that like she was going to live at, like this with her daughter forever. And I think it's frightening to her not to have that kind of that kind of codependent relationship any longer. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting what you're saying. Like she, in many ways, is a performer as well as Mitch, but just a performer in a very different kind of way. Yes, I think that's true. I, I absolutely think that the kind of audience that you know my daughter Miriam has is obviously one in which she's trying to make them laugh. I don't have the same, you know, my character Rose doesn't have the same need, but I do think that she, when, when she presents herself, whether it be to her friends or to her, you know, relations, I think that there's a part of her that wants to be seen as kind of queen. And, um, and that's, that's kind of a beautiful quality to have, I think. Yeah, for her, the biggest like uh, fear would be to have people laugh. Like she's yes. trying so hard to not yes. have people laugh. I think you're right. I think you're right. She she doesn't have that kind of sense of humor about herself. I think she's kind of brilliant and she is witty. I think she has a wit. Yeah. But I, but you're right. It's a very different. It's a different kind of audience that she seeks. And, and I think. Uh, and I think the thing that I I found particularly interesting about Rose is um, in a show that you said that had such. Uh, fast like repartee between all the characters and things it's often your character it's through her not saying anything or a moments of silence that it can say the most um, ah. about. and um how do you um 
how do you approach those scenes where you've got to say a lot but you don't have the big long dialogues and things yeah you know um when i was young and i i started out i was a ballet dancer and you know obviously in the world of ballet they don't speak and so when i kind of flipped it i got an injury went to college and then realized i loved performing so maybe i could kind of veer it over uh to theater and it's funny the first kind of couple performances i had i prayed not to have any lines because i knew what it meant to be alive on a stage and to have response but i really didn't trust articulation with the voice and and so i welcome any part of Rose that actually gets to just regard things by by sort of taking in what's happening, it's harder and scarier for me to actually speak. So I guess in answer to your question, I, I find it thrilling when I have scenes where I'm just, for instance, we shot one last week where I'm sort of dissatisfied with what's happening in my family life. So I'm just sort of sipping tea or actually at that point, I'm like um, dividing up a grapefruit. And the whole scene is really just watching the world go by and watching my daughter and my husband and sort of my wonderful maid Zelda. And those are the kind of scenes that I enjoy so much. There's just like one little tidbit of information I gave and then the rest of it is sort of, you know, with is nonverbal. I love those scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, you did uh, have a scene where you did get to say a lot in the synagogue, though, yes. in the end of season one. Uh, yes. How, how do you find? How did you find that one? You know, I don't know if uh, this ever went to, went to went to the press, but um, apparently they looked at about fifty different temples before we found one that accepted what words were going to be spoken within that temple. Um, you know, obviously I don't want to put it on air again. I'll just encourage people to go watch that episode. But yes, I do say a word beginning with F in the middle of a very religious, you know, setting in front of the, the group and in front of the cantor and in front of the rabbi. And I'll tell you the truth, my mother-in-law, who I respect and admire so much, I live I lived with a little bit of fear that she would actually not enjoy that episode. And she goes to the temple and her friends do as well. And so there was kind of an apology that I gave to everyone before. And luckily I, I didn't hear uh, too much criticism, but it was it was a little frightening to be in in the midst of God and speak those words. But it, but it was actually very enjoyable too. It's but like yes, they really did. You know, I don't know if you know this, so they have to send various um you know i guess if you're shooting in a temple as well as if you're shooting in a church wherever you you shoot you obviously have to send the script mm -hmm. and apparently those script that script was sent to those temples and it was like no 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 and finally there was one like way off in coney island or something that was like oh yes we'll take that <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's like uh, it's sort of like when Martin Sheen had to smoke in the Washington National Cathedral. Yes, and, yes, uh, yes, exactly. And, uh, I like. I remember reading with that that perhaps he didn't like. They didn't check that with the cathedral first. Right, like, it's so. just a small detail yeah. that was omitted. Yeah. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> the first uh, couple of times we ran that scene, and I had to yell it. You know, and I had to yell it. Mm. I swear, I did it so quietly, and I think the director was Dan, and he was like, "It's okay." You know, I mean. God will go to sleep, right? <laughs> you, can, you can yell. So yeah, he's like, "Don't worry, we've booked the we've booked the place for the day." Yeah, we booked like, the place, yeah, right? We, exactly. Don't, don't worry, worry. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, um, what what's the most fun thing about the show for you? Well. You know, I have a cast of brilliantly funny people, whether it's, of course, Tony Shalhoub and, uh, you know, Alex Borstein and Rachel Brosnahan, all of them, right? And Kevin Pollack and, and also Caroline Aaron. So whenever we do the scenes, particularly like those the, the big family scenes, everybody kind of enjoys making each other laugh. And there is that kind of thing that happens uh, as a performer where, you know, the most delightful times are when you actually can't keep a straight face so i'd say tony shalhoub and i have moments where we're making each other laugh so hard that we we can't really finish the scene i'm not sure that makes the director so happy because we kind of got to get to it but but those are my favorite moments is when we actually are cracking each other up and making mistakes there's something about you know amy is more so than anyone I've ever worked with, she is a wordsmith and every single detail, you probably know this from other shows that she's worked on, uh, it's not like you can say they are if it's there. You know, you can't say it is if it's it's. It has to be exact. And so there are sort of funny moments when we say it's so completely botched that it's kind of a delight.
Yeah. No, no improv on the Marvels. Yeah, no, 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 there's no improv as far as my character goes. Now I did hear, you know, Jane Lynch was on it. Yeah. And Wally Shawn as well. Um, uh, Luke Kirby. There's a, there are a group of performers they've had that are so brilliantly funny. Maybe Alex too has had this happen where she's actually said something that just sort of came out and maybe they've ended up saying, all right, let's keep that. But most of the time I would say, no, it's literally perfect to the page. Yeah. Even in the, like, does it ever get refined after the rehearsal process? If any, you know what, when I worked on Two and a Half Men, as you probably know from the multi-camera uh, comedies, they, they rewrite them every day. Sometimes they rewrite them 10 times a day. Sometimes they rewrite them in performance 40 times. Um, I would say when you see a script and you go to the read through, you might get like one page out of the 80 that changes because they had to change a name for legal reasons. <laughs> but I don't think they've changed very much. No, not, not really. Interesting. Um, with the um, and well, obviously the show's had a lot of Golden Globe success and awards uh, notice. You won Best Comedy Musical Series. You um, Rachel won Best Actress. What's that been like? The um, sort of awards attention and success. Yeah. You know, I'm going to speak from the heart about this. I um, I think that that when you're young you know, and you set off to become an actor, you obviously have to have a crazy amount of high dreams because you have to be kind of nuts to enter this profession, right? Um, because there's so much rejection. So it just means that, um, you know, when I first was on a show called Once and Again, we were also nominated for a Golden Globe and I went to that, that award ceremony and I didn't know what I was doing. I swear I remember the first time they opened the door and you see all the people with the flash and you just think, I feel like a zoo animal, right? So I didn't really appreciate it and maybe I even thought that it would happen more. Uh, but the truth is that it's few and far between that you actually go to those award shows. That was only the second time in these, whatever, 25 years I've been an actor that I've really ever been to something of that magnitude. And I was so starstruck. That's what I want to say. I was so amazed that a Meryl Streep or, you know, Susan Sarandon or, you know, you name it, Glenn Close, you name it. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I was just literally, sorry, that was my dog alarm there i um i think that there wasn't even a part of me that thought we would win and i mean that i didn't i didn't know what i was going to wear until a couple days before so i sat down i didn't know jeff bezos was going to sit at the table i had to do a little bit of googling to find out does he have children so that if i actually end up sitting next to him i can ask him about his kids yeah. so um Basically, I was kind of so stunned throughout the whole thing that when Rachel won, I turned to Michael Zegan, who plays my son-in-law, and then Tony Shalhoub was on my other side, and I turned to them and I said, oh my God, I guess it's possible we would win. What would we do? And, and they, were, they looked at me like I was nuts, and they were like, you, you would get on a stage. And so sure enough, a few, like whatever, five minutes later, they called our name, and again, I sort of turned to them, and I hadn't really figured out that we would be walking on the stage. But we walked on the stage and I turned to Michael and or Michael turned to me and said, that's really Barbara Streisand. And, you know, it was really I felt very fortunate to be amongst a group of women that day. You probably remember that was sort of the day where everyone was encouraged to wear black um, in sort of solidarity for the Me Too movement. And there were so many Frances McDormand made that speech. You know, there were so many moments in which you felt so lucky to, to hear a group of women speak out about about what it means to have the power of, of, of supporting one another. So that's a long way of saying I was in awe. I was so thrilled. Yeah. And especially oh, yeah. on that. Yeah. And especially on that night. Great. Uh, the a show um, where women are so much at the center um, and a women's voice is so much at the center of the show that um, it was able to win, which is really cool. Fit, fit with the theme of the night. Um, yeah. We got two two more questions. One is what uh, what do you find the funniest thing about the show? Um, I think I I think I I, I love I love that Ra so Rachel's character and Rachel herself is kind of a little bit of a magical creature. She's um, so positive. You know, she's filled, it's like she's the caretaker for all of us. 
on the show. I call her, if we have to do something for publicity, I literally call her and say like, what are the names of like fashion designers? I'm going to the mall. So what's so great is seeing her character fall apart. You know, it's just, whether it was in the pilot, what happened when she drank too much and ended up in having her first big set, right? Or in some of the scenes that she's had with Susie, going to the court, you know, I mean, when she's ended up having Michael in bed with her and he has to sneak out in Romeo and Juliet fashion, these kind of scenes where I'm knocking on the door sort of saying, what's going on in there, right? They are so fantastic to see a, a, such a together person not not necessarily Rachel, but to see that character fall apart and what it means to fall apart, she does it with such delight and such like, it's almost like Lucille Ball, right? Or Carol Burnett, right? I mean, it, it's, it's so much fun to see such a, a positive, uh, brilliant character that's so witty and smart not be on her game. And not being on her game is what makes her so funny. So I love that. That's one of my most favorite parts of the show. Mm, yeah, and um, what uh, what's something you have learnt from shooting the first season, or if you're shooting the second season at the moment, you can include that too. But what's something you've learnt from your time on Mrs. Maisel? Yeah, I operate as a person um, with a lot of, I suppose, a lot of fear and insecurity, and I think I'm allowed to say we went. I am. We went to Paris to shoot for a couple of weeks. Oh, and course. my character is so ballsy in Paris. She is so strong. Let me tell you, that's uh, what I can tell you is that she literally kind of transforms and surprises me. Like I, to find her voice, I had to leap like into a pool, not knowing if there'd be water or not, you know? And, and I had to learn how to speak French and I had to learn the accent. I had, I had a lot of delightful things that in my own life would be frightening. And so I guess that's what I've been most amazed by. And, and so kind of, um, so feeling so blessed to have happen is that I kind of can't kind of like an improv where you can't say no or you kind of shut down a scene. I can't say no to this character. The hats that they put me in, the costumes they put me in, the scenarios they put me in, I have to be incredibly open hearted. And Amy's like that. You look at the way she dresses to award ceremonies or even in real life, she has style and, and such a flair for, as I said earlier, artistry. And I feel like I have to enter that kind of world and be unapologetic. And, and let's just say that the women today and, and, and the young girls who are rising up and having like strength of voice, it, it, it sort of makes me celebrate um, trying to be strong in myself in a way that the way I was brought up, I didn't have that, that kind of courage. Mm -hmm. That's a, sorry, that's a long answer, but nice. maybe that's what the show is teaching me, right? It's sort of, and maybe it's very moving to other people too is, is, you know, this character, Miriam, it just no holds barred. She like opens herself up. She literally opens herself up. And, and in a way, we all have to approach life that way. We have that very, you know, difficult and challenging time right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like the best thing we can do is sort of trust ourselves and our inner voices and sort of go after what we believe in. Mm -hmm. Well, Maren, all the best with the Emmy Awards that are coming up and mm. uh, for you and the show. And, uh, yeah, it's all the best for season two as well. It's been lovely thank chatting. And, and may I say thank you for the viewers because, obviously, it's not easy sometimes to, to find new content amidst all the extraordinary new shows. And I feel so lucky that people enjoyed this show. And I also just um, I encourage everybody to watch season two. And thank you so very much for interviewing me. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll press the stop button.